Hello and welcome once again to the LO Ministries live stream. This is number eight in a series of messages which I've been privileged to be able to share with you. And it's such a thrill to know that these messages are going out all over the world and people have been passing them on to others. And we've had many emails back from people who have been blessed through what they have heard and encouraged. We're hearing too of many testimonies of the things that God is doing in people's lives, not just as they listen to these messages, but through this time of lockdown. A lot of people are using it as a season for really spending time focusing on their faith and finding out more about really what they believe and praying about how they should live in the kingdom of God. And the title of this first uh, message in a new series is simply called Living in the Kingdom of God. In the first two series that I've given of, over this lockdown season, the first was on hope and peace and joy, and the second was on the, the principles that will enable us to be fruitful in the kingdom, uh, hearing God, trusting him, waiting on him and serving him. But now we're moving on to living in the kingdom of God as a separate subject. And the first uh, subject of this series is simply the gospel of the kingdom. Now, we've heard from many different people and we still want to hear from you. So if you'd like to feed back to us at the end of this message or share things with us about what God is doing in your lives, we'd love to hear from you. And as usual, here is our email address, which is very easy for you to take down. Hello at ll.org. Hello at ll.org. Org. Now, our subject for today, the gospel of the kingdom, is one of the most important ones that we can look at as Christians about learning to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus called people to follow him. And at the end of Matthew's gospel, when he gave the great commission to the church, he told us to go out and make disciples. It's the Holy Spirit that makes believers but the first disciples were given the instruction to go and make disciples, make more disciples out of the believers who have come under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and been born again of the Spirit of God. And they were commissioned to teach them how to live as followers and as disciples of Jesus. When Jesus talked about his kingdom, which we'll look at more later this today, uh, he wasn't just asking people to follow him so that they could get saved and, as it were, hang on to his coattails just before they die. He was wanting people to follow him throughout their lives and to be followers who actually did the things that the teacher, Jesus, told them to do. And the gospel of the kingdom, therefore, is absolutely vital. Uh, and we cannot really separate it from the gospel of salvation but it's the gospel of salvation, which is, brings us the grace to, through which we can enter the kingdom. And it's entering the kingdom and then living in the kingdom, which is the requirement, which is the objective, which is the desire, I pray, of your hearts uh, as you seek to live for Jesus here in this fallen world. Let me ask one or two questions, as I usually do. What is a kingdom is probably the first question that's on my list. What is a kingdom? I actually live in the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And when we're talking about it being as a kingdom, it means that we have a monarch, a sovereign, who is, well, in our case, the queen. And I was born under the reign of King George VI. Uh, but we now have a queen and she's been on the throne since 1952, a very long time. And she is the monarch at the head of the King United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland. Now, I have here a passport, uh, which actually has on the front there, uh, United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And this tells people when I travel around the world that uh, I am a citizen of this United Kingdom. But when you look inside the passport, you see a picture of myself, and then you see the various details, and you can probably see there that uh, my birthday is on there, 
the 25th of November, 1943. Now the passport requires a birth certificate for it to have validity. The passport is, depends on the fact that you were actually born inside the kingdom. And here is my birth certificate, which shows the fact that I was born on the 25th of November, 1943. My parents' names are on there. And not only that, it says on that this was registered on the 26th of November, 1943. And there is the stamp with King George VI head on it to indicate under which sovereign uh, I was born as a citizen of the United Kingdom. So I have a passport, I have a birth certificate, and they prove that, that my citizenship is of this country, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And in days gone by, the king, the queen, had absolute power. The subjects of the kingdom accepted the authority of the king and they lived under that authority. The king had absolute power. He could do whatever he wanted. Today, we have a government in place, we're in the parliament, but still here in the United Kingdom that any law that's enacted by parliament does not become effective until the law is signed by the sovereign. So we are a kingdom and we are citizens of a kingdom. Now let's look at scripture for a little while now and uh, see where the word kingdom comes in. The first reference we actually have to kingdom is with, in Exodus chapter 19, uh, where the people of God, the children of Israel, were set aside to be a kingdom of priests, that they were to be servants of the whole world, to bring the whole world into the knowledge of God. But when we come to David, He's looking in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 to 13, as a really remarkable passage where David has got a deep understanding of what it means to be actually under the sovereign rule of, of God himself and his kingdom. And this is what he wrote. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel from everlasting to everlasting. In that first part of this passage of scripture, David is recognizing that God from everlasting to everlasting is no, no beginning, no end. God is eternal. So that he's got a, an existence and a kingdom which is beyond the sort of understanding that David had of a kingdom because in his day and in our day, when the king dies, a new kingdom a new king comes on the throne. So a kingdom has a limit to the life of the king. But when we're talking about God's kingdom, it's everlasting to everlasting, said David. And then he, he went on to write this. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. You, everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. So David is recognizing that beyond the, the confines of an earthly kingdom, there is a kingdom, a spiritual kingdom, which is from God, who is creator of all things, the universe and everything in it. And David is saying that yours, Lord, is that kingdom. You're exalted as head over all. And then finally, in this little passage, he says this, wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and we praise your glorious name. And in this final part of this beautiful and very important passage of scripture, David is recognizing that he is under the authority of the, the ruler of all things. And he was actually submitting his life to the ruler. Now, when we're talking about living in a kingdom, we are, as a citizen of the United Kingdom, I'm submitted to the rulership of the country in which I live. But David was looking far beyond the country in which he lived. He was looking into eternal things and he was submitting, coming before God 
to say that you are effectively, you're God, you're a ruler, you're a ruler of all things, and I live under your authority. Now, the word submission is actually not a very popular word. People don't like to be under somebody else's authority. But it's only if you're under authority that you can actually live in security and safety. Very shortly in the middle of this uh, lockdown period, they're going to start playing football again in this United Kingdom. They've already started in one or two other countries. And every football team has a manager. And every player in the team has to come under the authority of the manager. And if the players do not submit to the authority of the manager, they're out of the team because they're not team players. And God has called us to be team players with him and to come under his authority, to submit to what he tells us to do and not to actually tell God what we want him to do. There's a, a rightful spiritual submission to the authority of the king. And David had really got hold of that, that this was so important. And it's a theme which actually goes through the whole of scripture. In Daniel chapter four and verse three, where we read words that Daniel spoke to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute king. He had absolute authority. But when he was, Daniel was asked by Nebuchadnezzar to interpret a dream, Daniel began with these words, how great are his signs? And he's talking about God. How great are his signs? How mighty are his wonders? His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Now, this was a very courageous thing for Daniel to say as a subject of an absolute king who had absolute authority to say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, there is an authority higher than yours. <laughs> and it's the one who's got an authority greater than yours that I'm submitting to. And I'm trusting him to give me the interpretation of the dream. Daniel witnessed to Nebuchadnezzar the absolute truth that God's kingdom is an eternal kingdom. It's above all other kingdoms. It's even, Nebuchadnezzar, above yours. And his dominion endures from generation to generation. And that's the kingdom that I'm spiritually submitted to. So Daniel's a courageous witness as we look at other episodes in his life. You see the same theme going through his life of obedience to God, irrespective of the consequences. When we look at Isaiah, who was prophesying about the future king, the one who would come and would be in authority, in Isaiah 9, verse 6 to 7, he tells us that this future king was going to come as a baby. And these words from Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, we read them regularly at Christmas time as we go over the, the story of the birth of the Messiah. But this is what Isaiah wrote hundreds of years before Jesus came. For unto us a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So here is Isaiah looking to the coming of the Messiah as a baby, but saying that even this baby is in a position of authority and the government shall be upon his shoulders. There's a kingdom which is beyond the earthly kingdom. And Isaiah is looking to that and recognizing that this baby who comes will have a spiritual authority, which is beyond any earthly authority. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And Isaiah goes on to say of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And Isaiah is picking up again on what David recognized, that this was a kingdom which was ever from everlasting to everlasting. There was no beginning, no end. There was no limit that here was this, this baby that was going to come 
is going to be the one who's coming from that kingdom and will still carry the authority of that kingdom when he comes. He will reign over his kingdom forever and forever. So in the Old Testament, we have a number of prophetic passages which are talking about the coming of the Messiah as the one who would be the king of the kingdom, the one who was prophesied and who we celebrate at Christmas time. Now, I'm going to picking out just one or two things from the, the life of Jesus, which uh, help us to expand our understanding of this whole concept of kingdom. Because when Jesus stood before Pilate, do you remember the end towards the end of his life? He was about to be crucified and he was passed from Pilate then to Herod and back to Pilate. And uh, before Pontius Pilate, uh, Jesus said these words, speaking to Pontius Pilate, who was the governor at that time under Rome. And Jesus said in John 18, verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Now, Jesus is now teasing out the difference between the kingdoms of this world and the kingdom that he comes from. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. It's a, a kingship which is to do with the whole of created order. But this world at the moment, he's implying, which we'll explain in a few minutes, this world at this present time is not under my authority. Ultimately, it's under the authority of the God of the universe. But at this moment of time, there is a kingdom here which I'm not part of. My kingdom's not of this world. He's saying something very specific that he as he stands before Pilate, he's the king of a kingdom. But it's not a kingdom, which is an earthly kingdom. And Pilate has this discussion with Jesus saying, well, you're a king then. And Jesus says, yes, you say it, I'm a king. In fact, the reason I was born, he said, and came into the world is to testify to this truth. So Jesus says something very profound to Pilate. He said, the reason that I was born to come and testify to this truth, that I am a king. He's a king of the universe is sovereign of, in government over the, the kingdom of heaven. And he's coming to declare into this fallen world, which has sold itself into a different kingdom, which we'll look at in a moment. He's saying, my kingdom is not of this world. And I have come into this fallen world to illustrate and to show you that there is a kingdom which you can enter into, which will be separate from the kingdom which is controlled by the God of this world. Jesus was just simply recognizing the situation that this world was under the control of a different authority for the present time. And in John 12, verse 31, Jesus expands on this when he says this. Now is the time for this world to be judged. And now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. So here's Jesus, who's the king of his kingdom. But he's talking about a ruler of this world. Now, a ruler is a king. So Jesus is saying there is a ruler in this place, in this kingdom, which is not the original ruler that God intended, but is one who has come and taken the place of the living God on this planet Earth in response to man's invitation. Now, what we're looking at now is, is the story of the fall as to what happened. You may think, well, man's invitation. How did man invite Satan to become the God of this world? Well, what happened at the fall was really very simple, that we, we know from other scriptures that Satan, who used to be called Lucifer, was thrown out of heaven and he lost his authority in heaven, but he still had power. But when he was thrown out of heaven and then God created man on earth, God gave to man authority and dominionship over this planet, over planet earth. Man became the ruler, as we read in Genesis. 
So God created man. Man was the ruler under God of planet Earth. But then Satan comes along and tempts man. A man chooses to obey Satan. And this is what's described as the fall of man. Because when you choose to obey somebody, whatever authority you have, and the dominionship over this earth was given to mankind, that was authority to rule, as it were, on this planet. That authority was given away. That authority was given away to Satan. And Satan became the ruler of this whole world. Now, John, 1 John 5, 19, he simply just makes us a statement. He says that we know, and we as believers, we belong to God, even though the whole world is under the rule of the evil one. So John's making a very simple statement. He's saying the whole world is under the rule of the evil one. It's a very profound statement. But he's saying that as believers in God, We've come out from under that reign of the one who's the evil one who controls this world. We now belong to God, but we're living in an alien place. We're living in a place where Satan, as the ruler of this world, is in control. But we still belong to God. So he's looking at the, sort of the difference between the rulership of the God of this world and of the rulership of the kingdom of God. Now, this is exactly what Jesus was trying to explain to Pilate. He's saying, my kingdom is not of this world. And yet there was a kingdom in this world, which Jesus was not of. See, every human being that's a citizen of this world, they have sinned. I have a passport here, as we looked earlier, and this passport identifies me as a citizen of the United Kingdom, it also identifies me as having born, been born on planet Earth. And so I'm born into a sinful inheritance. And all of mankind has been born into that. And John is saying in 1 John 5, 19, we who are believers, even though we've been born into a spiritual sinful inheritance, we have come out from under that authority. And we're now under the authority of the God of heaven. We're now under the authority of the king of kings. We're now under the authority of the one who said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. So spiritually, we are now living under the authority of a different spiritual authority. Even though we're physically still here, we don't spiritually belong to the God of this world. It's a very profound statement. We're no longer as believers, subjects, meaning sub submitted to the authority, the spiritual authority of Satan's kingdom. Something has happened to us. There's been a transfer of spiritual citizenship. They've moved from being under the reign of one king, the God of this world, and we've moved to be citizens of the kingdom of heaven under the authority of the king of the kingdom of heaven, who is Jesus. So this now poses a very important question. And this is at the heart of evangelism, it's the heart of discipleship, is how do we get from being under the authority of the God of this world to being under the authority of the God of heaven? How do we move from the kingdom of darkness, you might say, to the kingdom of light? How do we move from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of heaven? Which brings us to a very important discussion which took place in John's Gospel, chapter 3. John 3, 16 is probably the most famous verse in the whole of the Bible, but we're just going a bit before John 3, 16 and looking at the verses 3, 4, 5, and 6 of John's Gospel, chapter 3, where there's some very important discussion taking place between Jesus and one of the Pharisee leaders called Nicodemus. And this is what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Verily, truly, I tell you, no one can see, and that means also understand, no one can see, no one can understand the kingdom of heaven unless they are born again. Now, it's a, a conundrum. Here's an adult person, Jesus saying to him, you won't understand about the kingdom of heaven unless you are born again. And Nicodemus comes back with a very logical question, which all of us would have asked. How can someone be born when you're old? 
Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. It's a very logical question because physically you cannot go back into your mother's womb and be born. So, so Jesus, what are you talking about? And Jesus answered Nicodemus in this way. He said, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. So the natural birth gives birth to a human baby, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And Jesus is saying that, yes, you're physically a human being, you're an adult, but spiritually, you're still a citizen of another kingdom. And if you're going to enter another kingdom, out, come out of that kingdom into the kingdom of light from the kingdom of darkness, you have to be born into that kingdom. And this is where we get the phrase from being born again. We are moving from the control, the authority of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom that this world that is under the rule and reign of Satan, and we are being reborn through by the Spirit into the kingdom of heaven. The people who are living in the world as it is now, who have not seen and understood the need for a spiritual rebirth, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 explains that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this, this age has blinded them. And you see it right across the world today, the people totally ignoring the, the need for submitting to the authority of the living God. They, they, they don't want to even consider the fact that God exists. They, they've been blinded, blinded by false understandings. They've been led into deception. And then they're building a false kingdom, a false authority in that deceptive place. And their eyes, as it were, are blinded. They can't actually see the truth of who Jesus is, who Jesus was when he came, how he, who he is now, and the fact that one day he's going to come again. They cannot see the light of the gospel. And it's only the Holy Spirit that can take away those blinders, can take away that shield which prevents people to understand and the work of the kingdom of God, the work of the followers of Jesus is to so witness to the truth in a fallen world that people start beginning to ask the questions. What do you mean? Uh, Nicodemus said, what do you mean about being born again? And when people begin to ask those questions, then we need to give them the answers which God has provided in his word and pray for them that the Holy Spirit will take away the blinders from their eyes so that they begin to see, not just with their physical eyes, but they begin to see with the eyes of the Spirit that outside of the kingdom of God, they're in the kingdom of darkness. And in the kingdom of darkness, the judgment upon Satan is eternal death. And that those who are choosing to follow Satan, that's where they go. And Jesus says, I want you to know me. My kingdom is different. My kingdom is from another place. My kingdom is a kingdom of light, the kingdom of truth, the kingdom of life, the kingdom of love. And I want you to enter into that kingdom. I want you to come and receive salvation. See, the gospel is a gospel of a kingdom. And salvation is the means through which we enter in to the new kingdom. And this is the heart of this most famous of all the scriptures for God. Love the world so much. John 3, 16. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not die but have eternal life. Now, what does this mean? If you're still living in the old kingdom, then death is your destination when you leave this planet. But when you move from one kingdom to another, you're a follower of Jesus, you're in his kingdom, and his 
his kingdom is an eternal kingdom, as David was talking about, everlasting to everlasting. It's a kingdom of life. You move from the death of Satan's kingdom into the life of the kingdom of God. And we move from one through repenting. We come and we recognize that, yes, there is sin in our heart and that sin needs to be confessed. And we recognize when we understand the cross that Jesus, the totally sinless son of God, he paid the price of death for you and for me. But because he'd never sinned, death could not hold him. And he was raised again from the dead, triumphant over death and over the grave. And he says, come to me, come to me, all you who would come, come. And I won't refuse anybody who chooses to come with submitted heart, confessing their sin and thanking Jesus, the fact he paid the price for our sin. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him should not perish, should not die, but have eternal life. And you move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of heaven, and you're moving from death to life. It's a change of citizenship. The gospel is good news of salvation as the means of grace, but we enter into the kingdom of God. And this is the gospel of the kingdom. In Luke's gospel, chapter 17 and verses 20 to 21, Jesus had one of his many interchanges into with the Pharisees they were always trying to trip him up and attack him and Jesus always has answers which they were completely confounded by and Luke 17 20 to 21 says this once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come Jesus replied the coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed nor will people say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you incredibly profound statement you can't go all over the planet looking oh here's the kingdom or there's the kingdom because you know it's not a, a territory it's not hasn't got borders you don't need an earthly passport he's saying the kingdom of god is within you and when we have received jesus when he has become savior we have made him lord of our lives and we've been born again into this kingdom the kingdom is within us so that wherever we go, whatever territory of the world we're in, whatever country we go to, whatever part of any country we go to, we are in a place where the kingdom of God is within us. Now, wherever we go, and for the whole of time. So Jesus proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, and he died on the cross to give us right of entry. We don't have a physical passport but we have a spiritual passport, which comes as we are born again of the Spirit of God. When John the Baptist began his ministry, he remember he was the prophet who was the forerunner of the coming Messiah. And in Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, uh, the heart of his message was simply expressed as, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, there are two meanings for this passage, this, this verse. Repent for the kingdom of heaven because the king of the kingdom is there. So John is saying, repent because the king of the kingdom of heaven has come and he's near. But he's also saying in a prophetic sense that now that the king has come, there's going to come a time when he comes again and the kingdoms of this world will be wound up and there will come a time when there'll be no more time to choose which kingdom you want to live in. So repent, make sure that now is the day of salvation for you. Repent now, don't wait for some time in the future because you may never get that opportunity in the future again. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then when Jesus began his own ministry, after John the Baptist in Matthew 4, 17, Almost the opening words of Jesus's ministry were exactly the same. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 4, 17. So Matthew 3, 2, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And Jesus, in Matthew 4, 17, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so when Jesus began his ministry, he was saying there is a kingdom which 
I'm the king of. My kingdom, not of this world. And you need to repent because there's not going to be a time for all of time for you to actually make that choice. You need to actually make the choice now. Now is the day of salvation, we read in the scripture. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And when we turn to Matthew 5, verse 3, this is right at the beginning of what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount begins with, the teaching begins with this word about peace in our hearts and humility. And Matthew 5, 3 reads like this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And poor in spirit, that simply means humble. You're not rising up in arrogance to tell God what he's got to do. You are coming in submission to the one who is the king of the kingdom. You're submitting to his authority. That's simply what it means to be poor in spirit. You are saying that his authority is greater than mine. And I love him and I want to actually come under his authority. And so she's saying the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are poor in spirit. So when Jesus comes and teaches about the kingdom, he's saying, I want you to be part of the kingdom. And then we have in Matthew chapter 6, the, Jesus giving us the disciples a prayer. And in the middle of this prayer in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, we read about yours is the kingdom. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the prayer is simply, Lord, I want your kingdom authority in my life. I want your kingdom to, be, to reign in who I am and what I do. I want to follow you all my days. So when we pray the Lord's Prayer together, yours is the kingdom. We're saying, God, Jesus, I want to be under your authority. And so the gospel of the kingdom is a gospel, yes, of submission to the authority of the king, because he's the one who's in authority. All the governance of the world is upon his shoulders. And we come before him, humbly submitting, poor in spirit, not arrogant and proud. But Jesus is saying, the kingdom of heaven is yours. You've come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. You have a new passport for a new kingdom. You've been a new birth certificate for the kingdom of heaven. You've been born again of the kingdom of heaven. And when you read through Matthew's gospel, you read many, many occasions where Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like and Matthew's gospel is called the, the, parent, the gospel of the kingdom because there's so much in it about understanding what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven as opposed to a citizen of the kingdom of darkness of the kingdom of this world. And in the next of these uh, lockdown messages on living in the kingdom of God, I'm going to be looking at some of those parables of the kingdom because they have incredibly important teaching that for us to live by, to help us to understand the kingdom and to be able to live according to the ways of the kingdom so that we will know the blessings of the kingdom. Some of you are probably waiting. I wonder what him Peter's going to choose today to illustrate what he's been teaching. Well, I've chosen a hymn from one, a man who is extremely well known as a hymn writer named Isaac Watts. And one of the reasons I've chosen his hymn, Jesus Shall Reign Where'er the Sun, is that this is exactly what he did. That when he preached, he preached from the word and then he announced a new hymn to the congregation who would sing for the very first time the teaching that he'd just been giving. And it's in Isaac Watts, it's a very similar thing to what Charles Wesley did for John Wesley. John Wesley preached sermons and Charles Wesley wrote the hymns which illustrated the teaching of John Wesley. But Isaac Watts did both. He, he actually wrote over 800 hymns altogether uh, in the end of the 17th and beginning of the 18th centuries. And this hymn expresses the authority of the king 
of the kingdom of heaven. That wherever you go, the kingdom of heaven is, because the kingdom of heaven is within you. So he says, Jesus shall reign. Where'er the sun does its successive journeys run. This is poetry of the 18th, 18th century. And uh, Isaac Watts was acclaimed not just as a hymn writer, but actually as a great poet as well. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. So Isaac Watts is saying beyond this planet beyond this universe there is a kingdom a spiritual kingdom where jesus reigns forever and ever to him shall endless prayer be made and praise his throng to crown his head his name like sweet perfume shall rise with every morning sacrifice and as we worship jesus our king with prayer and praises we bless him and he blesses us in that sacrifice of praise and prayer we receive as we give. People and realms of every tongue dwell on his love with sweetest song, and infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name. As it was touching here into the fact that you don't have to wait till you're old to be born again of the Spirit of God. The children can receive life. Children have a, a deep inner spirituality of awareness and wonder. And it's very easy for them to actually enter into the kingdom of God as they become aware of the reality of the love of Jesus. Infant voices shall proclaim their early blessings on his name. Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoners leap to lose their chains. The weary find eternal rest. And all who suffer want are blessed. And this, this verse, is, it sums up the outworking of the gospel, that when we're in him, blessings abound where'er he reigns, wherever he reigns, where he reigns in our life, wherever we are, we are walking within who he is and enjoying his blessings. Prisoners leap to lose their chains. This is the heart of the gospel. This is from Isaiah 61, verse 1, that Jesus will come to set the captives free and the heart of the gospel to set the captives free that they may know freedom and the weary find eternal rest. And Jesus promises healing. He follows hope, promises restoration. And those verses in Isaiah 61, which go on to talk about how he would comfort all who mourn, all those who are suffering, he would bring healing to their broken hearts and all who suffer want are blessed. Amazing verse, which Isaac Watts just encapsulates in just, just a few words, the whole heart of what living in the kingdom of God is all about. And so he finishes with these words, let every creature rise and bring the highest honours to our king. Angels descend with songs again, and earth repeat the loud amen. Let every creature rise and bring the highest honours to our King. And that's indeed what I pray that you will do, that you will bring honour and blessing to the King as you share the truth of his word and his kingdom with those whom the Lord calls you to witness to. I want to close by quoting from Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 19, where Paul is talking to the people who is, uh, who are believers in Ephesus, and he's saying an extraordinary thing. He says, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God. See, a citizen of a kingdom, we have a passport which it tells about an earthly kingdom, but Paul is saying there's a different kingdom, and you are fellow citizens together. We're all sharing together as citizens, as subjects of the king, fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. What a privilege it is. What a joy it is for us to be members of the household of God. What a gospel we have to proclaim. We have proclaimed salvation as the means of grace through which we enter into the kingdom of God. And as we live within the kingdom of God under the authority of the king, his peace enters our hearts and his joy becomes the outworking of his life. And his purpose for our lives becomes clear as we move into the destiny that he's prepared for us. We're living in 
tempestuous times, tough times, dark times. And yet the truth of the kingdom of God is within you, said Jesus. The kingdom of God is within you so that whatever's happening around, whatever the circumstances are that any of you are going through right now, the kingdom of God is within you and you're secure and you're safe in him, both now and forever and forever and from ever, from everlasting to everlasting. My kingdom is not of this world, said Jesus, but his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. And we are citizens of that kingdom fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. I pray that the message today of living in the kingdom of God will have impacted your spirit and that the Lord will bless and encourage you as you dwell upon it and let the word of God take hold of you as you take hold of it and that the king will reign in your life and you will live for him forevermore. Bless you all richly. Look forward to being with you again next week.